Tengo el honor de presentar a la primera de nuestras ponentes, que es Harriet Emasi. Bienvenida, Harriet. Harriet Emasi es directora de la Biblioteca de la Universidad de Brown, como sabéis, donde llegó en 2005 procedente de la Indiana University, donde desempeñó el cargo de decana asociada ejecutiva de bibliotecas. Previamente fue bibliotecaria interina asociada para servicios técnicos y automáticos en la Rutgers University. Ya en Brown supervisa el sistema bibliotecario y lidera el desarrollo e integración de recursos de información y nuevas tecnologías en la docencia, el aprendizaje e investigación del campus. Es impulsora del Center for Digital Scholarship. Los objetivos principales de MASI han sido alinear los objetivos de la universidad y las acciones de la biblioteca y convertirla en un socio activo que contribuye al éxito académico de la universidad. Ha explorado y desarrollado experiencias relacionadas con métodos académicos tradicionales y digitales, con la docencia y el aprendizaje en línea y con la adaptación de colecciones, servicios y espacios de la biblioteca para satisfacer las necesidades cambiantes de estudiantes y docentes. En 2014 publica el artículo Trends in Digital Scholarship Centers, donde desarrolla, yo diría que ampliamente, la experiencia de la Brown University, de la que seguramente hoy nos hable también. El tema de su ponencia hoy es como todos sabéis, introducción a los laboratorios digitales, qué son, para qué sirven, a quién se dirigen, qué servicios ofrecen. ¿Mm? Y sin más preámbulos, cedo la palabra a Harriet. Good morning. Want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be here today as part of your workshop conference, and especially to thank Anna, who I met in uh, Rhode Island uh, last year about this time, uh, and all of the organizers who have worked so hard to bring this group together. Thank you for being here. Brown University is located in the northeast part of the United States in Rhode Island, very near Boston. The university was founded in 1764. Now, in the US, that is an old school. In Spain, that is not an old school. There are approximately 6,500 undergraduate university students and 2,000 graduate students. And Brown has been voted as having the happiest students in the US. They look happy here. As I prepared for this workshop, my thoughts kept returning to the many ways in which the patterns of scholarship and libraries have been and continue to be interrupted by the emergence of networked information, social media, and the democratization of digital creation. Everyone can take pictures and post them online. Everyone can communicate online. To examine this interruption more closely, I want to focus on four key issues. What is scholarship? What are the practices of scholars? How are these practices changing? And how are libraries changing in order to enable and participate in these practices? In 1990, Ernest Boyer, an American educator who served as chancellor of the state of New York, posted that traditional research alone, 
discovery, that type of research, would not inform the future of higher education, would not adequately serve society's educational needs, and would not contribute sufficiently to solve the real world's problems. Boyer believed that universities needed a more inclusive view of what it means to be a scholar, a recognition that knowledge is acquired through discovery and research, yes, but also through integration, through application, and through teaching. He developed a model of scholarship that includes these four elements. The scholarship of discovery is based on search and consumption of existing knowledge, as well as on applied research, the development or testing of theories or the expansion of established bodies of knowledge. The scholarship of integration is based on acquiring knowledge from different sources and different disciplines to discover ways in which they converge and complement each other. This is something that we see often in the library. The knowledge of application is based on identifying ways that new knowledge can be used to solve real world problems. And the scholarship of teaching is finding innovative applications and approaches and best practices to develop skills and disseminate knowledge. These are important issues for us today. These are ways in which our universities are aspiring to change and become and remain relevant to students and to society. Hardly a decade later, John Unsworth, who is now university librarian at the University of Virginia, outlined what he referred to as scholarly primitives, a set of basic practices or activities common to historical as well as current scholars across the discipline. These activities include discovery, whether through browsing printed text or catalogs, spending months and sometimes years to single-handedly survey large bodies of literature in order to compile and digest relevant information, or conducting and recreating mathematical calculations, lab-based experiments, or architectural designs to solve a problem or prove a theorem. Annotation is the practice by which scholars note these reactions or additions to the original author's findings. Scholars compare text, objects, images, or facts to determine relationships or differences. Referencing other works through footnotes is the means by which scholars leave intellectual trails indicating what they have found useful in their research or what helped them shape the point of view. Sampling is the method by which scholars embed small or large bits of evidence that may come from a variety of scholarly or popular sources, evidence that they think is relevant to their own arguments or conclusions, such as the antique map of Europe dated from 1630. The map shows not only the imagined land mass, but also includes images of the people and major cities across Europe. Here we see a close-up of a man and woman in traditional dress from the city of Toledo, along with a drawing of the town. Scholars have sought to prove or strengthen their point of view through illustrations using images that they or others created to pull readers into the narrative, to convince them of the author's theory or convey an interpretation or state of mind. From the very early days of publishing, 
there have been scholars who have pushed the boundaries of the printed text by including representations or reactions of activities or experiences as a means of engaging the reader and allowing the reader to interact with content. Experienced scholars and librarians know how to maximize the effectiveness of these practices in the analog world, and readers are typically familiar with and responsive to the established forms. Students are also aware of these practices, and by the time they reach teenage years, they have had many opportunities to learn and practice these methods at different stages throughout their education. Publishers are equipped to review, edit, and evaluate these scholarly works, as well as distribute the final pr products and promote their purchase through established channels. Having the imprimatur of a well-known press, along with peer reviews and citations by other scholars, are essential for a faculty member to satisfy the university's requirements for tenure and promotion. While not perfect, this structure or cycle for supporting scholarly communications has functioned effectively for decades, and research libraries have been part of this system. Libraries are well equipped to collect, describe, store, share, and preserve these conventional forms of scholarship. Library spaces and services have been built around acquiring and maintaining locally held collections, helping students and faculty find and use those collections, borrowing items from other libraries when necessary, and organizing staff in neatly separated groups and locations dictated by their primary responsibilities. But the emergence of mass digitization and born digital content, the global social network and expansion of digital technologies, the established practices and roles of scholars, publishers, libraries, and universities are beginning to change. Scholars in particular have been looking for new ways to engage with and communicate their research. Today, the scholarly primitives are taking a new shape. Discovery has the potential to encompass search and retrieval of all forms of data from all regions of the world without regard to the file size or format, language, time of day or night requested, or type of device to be used. Because restrictive payrolls, discoverability does not always lead to access, but we are observing and advancing and advocating for major changes in open access to scholarly research around the globe. Discovery in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as in the humanities and social sciences, is aided by computational methods and the power of high-performance computing. And students are taught to track and potentially share both their methodologies and their discoveries through the use of electronic lab notebooks and electronic portfolios. Valuable annotations by researchers long lost or forgotten in the scholarly record can now be recovered and along with newly created annotations captured, preserved, linked, or otherwise con connected to noteworthy com commentary. Comparison of text, objects, and images or data is facilitated by computational modeling and analysis and often further explicated through captivating visualizations such as the visualization of sound waves shown here. Referencing and sampling 
are no longer limited by footnotes or snippets from original source material. Instead, readers can be linked directly to the primary source material, whatever its format, so that they can examine the original data and test the reproducibility and validity of the researcher's findings. Likewise, illustrations and representations need not remain static. Readers can control the elements and manipulate the results, as well as become immersed into virtual environments and ex experiences made real through technology. Researchers are creating projects that invite the public's participation, as shown here in the empathetic cultural mapping project, an online interactive tool that includes the personal stories alongside big data and mapping analysis from the health sciences at the University of Calgary. In this new world of possibilities, we often find that scholars who are experts in their own field need to learn new skills in order to test and incorporate innovative approaches, approaches in their research. In many cases, scholars may not be aware of which methods or tools would achieve the best results. Senior faculty often learn from their students, junior colleagues and librarians about technology and methodologies that will help them articulate scholarly ideas, build and shape arguments, and provide synthesis or interpretation to advance their scholarship. What might begin as informal conversations and casual collaborations can develop into a more formal team-based approach with scholars welcoming the skills, knowledge, and imagination of students, librarians, and technologists, each partner contributing to the design, definition, and creation of the research product. But where will these new scholarly products be built? What kind of space and technology is needed for this type of collaborative work who will demonstrate and teach us and others the necessary technology and tools? How will the value of this research and the effectiveness of its forms and methodologies be evaluated? Who will publish this work, write peer reviews evaluating it, promote its availability, and ensure that it becomes part of today's and tomorrow's scholarly record? Who will maintain its functionality, enable additions or changes to the content, and pre preserve the work over time? And who will prepare the next generation of students and scholars to read, write, and think in the digital age? These are the questions that digital scholarship addresses. Digital scholarship is the use of digital evidence, digital methods of inquiry and research, and digital forms of publication and preservation to achieve and disseminate scholarly research, teaching, and learning. Most significantly, these are the questions that are currently shaping the future of scholarship and the future of libraries. Today's libraries is supporting the changing methods, patterns of teaching, learning, and research by combining traditional and new knowledge resources and services with emerging technologies in innovative physical and online spaces. Libraries are an important part of the research cyber infrastructure at the campus as well as the regional and national levels. 
to build digital scholarship services at our universities, we need to work with partners across campus and along with others at regional and national platforms. Many different kinds of organizational models exist for digital scholarship on university campuses. Let's take a look at four common models and perhaps you will see yourself in one of these models. The central model provides a solid staff staffing infrastructure in one place on campus. It facilitates connections between scholars, technologists, and libraries, such as coordinating software purchases, determining which technology platforms will be supported, and establishing digital preservation practices. The hub and spoke model includes a strong centralized digital presence that links out to many other resources on campus. The other resources may be part of academic departments, interdisciplinary units, libraries, or other service points on campus. This model allows services and expertise to develop where they are most needed rather than requiring faculty and students to depend on one central unit that may lack the resources or particular expertise that meets their needs. The mesh network. In the mesh network, there is no one dominant unit. Instead, each unit shares its knowledge to create a link network of expertise, software and hardware, contributing to the overall pool of practitioners on campus. Each unit specializes in what it does best, whether a specific research field, technology infrastructure, or information architecture. This allows deep knowledge and expertise to develop within each unit. Researchers' needs can be met locally within their home department. One dis potential disadvantage is that there can be duplication of services on campus and some confusion as to where certain services may be offered. In the recent years, we have seen a rise in consortial or multi-institutional model of cultivating digital scholarship. The consortial model is able to leverage resources and interest across a set of institutions in order to better support digital scholarship initiatives within each institution. Partnerships are more easily formed as the consortium provides a community in which to share ideas, collaborate on projects, learn and teach new skills, and formalize efforts. This model is a particularly attractive to institutions that lack resources or broad interests from their local environment. The diversity of institutional, academic, and professional backgrounds makes for a very stimulating collaborative environment that no sing single institution could provide alone. An important part of success of any service or space is communication and outreach. Communication needs to be directed outward to the campus community to raise awareness of the services and also about current projects, publications, or events. Communication is also necessary internally to ensure clarity around managing and producing collaborative projects, as well as carrying out day-to-day -day operations and keeping team members and all of the unit staff members informed. This is particularly important in a library where a sense of separation can grow among staff who are engaged in digital work and those who are assigned 
to more traditional responsibilities. We need to build and repair bridges where necessary and remind ourselves of the valuable contributions and connections among the work of all staff. As the last section of my presentation, I want to share with you some in images of digital scholarship spaces. As indicated on this slide, space is one aspect of digital scholarship programs. And I would say that it is not the most important aspect, but it is important and it's very visible. Other aspects include new forms of scholarly communication, teaching and learning, technology and tools, and staffing expertise. Let's look at a few images together. Here we see a space that helps create a sense of community. So space or place creating a sense of community. I won't uh, indicate the location of each of these, or perhaps it would be interesting for you. Can you read this slide? Can you, you, you can't see that. This is from, uh, it's called the Kitchen Table at a Greenhouse Studio in the library at University of Connecticut. Places and spaces provide project space. This is at uh, Georgia State University in the library. Places provide access to specialized tools. This is Duke University called the Edge. And in this particular place, uh, we see social science research work um, and also GIS and uh, social science data. Places provide an area for consultation, for meeting with students and other faculty. This is Emory University, the Digital Scholarship Center. Places for workshops. This is Claremont Colleges in California. Places for conferences and seminars. This is again Emory University uh, Center for Digital Scholarship. Places for classes, and this is an unusual configuration, uh, Florida Institute of Technology, the Digital Scholarship Laboratory. Places for collaborative work. This is at Brown University in the Digital Studio. Places for visualization. This is at North Carolina State University, the visualization lab, part of the library. This also is at North Carolina uh, State University, the virtual reality station. So I think one of the interesting things about these different places is that not all of them are um, very fancy or refined. This is a good example of a very simple environment uh, that does not take very much money to create, but provides a space and a service that is important. Often we find places for a service desk in a center for digital scholarship or a digital scholarship lab. This is Georgia State University. Places for fellows and student workers. This is University of Virginia uh, Scholars Lab, where they support a lot of graduate students doing work. Places for student assistants. Again, at Brown, we have students who work in our um, digital studio. And I don't know if you can see the sign that's next to this young man, but it says, ask me. Places for staff to work. Uh, again, Emory University. 
places for taking breaks, having a cup of coffee or a um, piece of fruit. This is McMaster's University Center for Digital Scholarship. This is in Canada. Places for displaying products of digital scholarship. This is UC, uh, University of uh, California in Los Angeles uh, in the research library. Very beautiful uh, space. And places for the public and for staff to test technology, to interact with technology. This is at Johns Hopkins University. A staff member is controlling the screen with his hands and arms. Places for hosting events, such as today's event at Emory University, Digital Scholarship. Virtual places, it's very important for us to have a virtual presence, an online presence describing our services, describing our spaces. And here we see uh, University of Pittsburgh, their web uh, presence, talking about their digital scholarship commons. And places for maker spaces. This is at University of Maryland. Again, a very um, a modest uh, space, a space that uh, did not require a lot of money to create, but an important space for allowing students and faculty and also library staff to experiment with new technologies. Now I was told that you would like to know more about maker spaces, but because the time for this talk was quite brief, I actually did not include the slides in this uh, talk, but perhaps I could shift to that. So more about maker spaces. This again is North Carolina State University, which has a new library. Um, their library looks like a spaceship. It, it, it's a very um, incredible library with lots of technology. And they have a number of maker spaces. Here we have two examples. I want to talk about some of the things that are often found in maker spaces. Um, digitization is often found in a maker space so that if you are interested in digitizing materials, if you come into the library and want to digitize, you can do that work yourself. Or in this case, uh, this is at Brown, uh, you can uh, ask someone to digitize for you. Media workstations. So I think this is a very important part of a maker space so that um, students and faculty and staff have places where they can spread out their materials, spend time to work on the uh, computer as well as incorporate their own information into this. Media workstations, uh, again, the ability to stay for a long time with a program uh, to take extended amount of time to do the work that is necessary to do. We often find um, audio visual uh, areas in maker spaces. This is from Brown. This is from University of Maryland a video recording studio. Again, a, a very simple space um, that the technology cost money, but it did not cost money to build the space. So I think it's important to remember that, that there are different ways of creating spaces. Here we see a maker space, again, from McMaster in uh, Calgary, uh, 
in Canada, um, an Arduino uh, workshop. Do you use Arduino here? Does anybody use Arduino? Yeah. So um, a, a platform to create electronic uh, products, yes. Uh, this is not used at Brown, but many other schools uh, use this. I think one of the most interesting aspects of maker spaces is 3D design, three-dimensional design, whether that is 3D printing, 3D scanning, 3D modeling, um, and Virginia Tech uh, has Virginia Tech uh, has a lot of engineering, and so they have a large um, uh, 3D design uh, studio. Duke University has a lot of 3D equipment. Um, there is one central place on the university campus at Duke. Uh, Duke is also a private. Uh, institution like Brown. Brown is slightly smaller and we actually have many places across campus that you can do 3D printing. The library is the only place that you can do color printing, so 3D color printing. But at Duke, print, 3D printing is done in one central place. University of uh, Virginia also has a very fancy uh, 3D printing place, um, very wonderful equipment. At Duke, 3D printing costs money. If a student or a faculty member wants to print something, they have to pay for it. At Brown, we have fewer people using 3D printing in the library, and we don't charge. There are other places on campus that might charge, but for now, at least, we don't charge. So different models of service are interesting and important. This is our uh, color 3D printer in the library, and this is a student. So we think it's important not that the expert does the printing, but that students learn to use this kind of equipment. At Duke, as we saw, it says leave the 3D printing to the experts, but we want students to learn and to experiment and to experience this. This is a item that was printed by a student, designed and printed by a student. It is uh, a small sample of the Sistine Chapel. It's very difficult to see this, but anyway, um, it's an interesting uh, product that was printed and thought of, imagined by the student. At Brown, we also this spring, we had a 3D uh, workshop, and it was a set of different classes, workshops, short workshops, like an hour or an hour and a half, taught by students, taught by faculty, taught by library staff, and taught by staff from a neighboring um, college, uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, which is very near uh, Brown University. So we did not have all of the expertise ourselves to teach these different things. Uh, I don't know if you can read them. It's modeling, photogrammetry, uh, 3D scanning, 360 degree video, cleaning and editing, painting, virtual reality, viewing the cave, and 3D printing. So we thought that it's important to give just a taste 
about each of these important areas. And so it was a very popular set of workshops. When we think about the products of 3D printing, we often think about the modeling that is done for medical. This is a 3D anatomical image of the brain. It was done at a hospital uh, in Rhode Island. But at Duke University, we see some other examples. And I'm going to go quickly because I just got my five-minute note. This is the work of a graduate student, uh, sculptures uh, modeled in 3D plastic. 3D modeling of a topographic map. This also is something that we might expect. Modeling done of a historic fish, uh, done at Brown. This is very interesting uh, in Iraq. Uh, the museum was destroyed by ISIS, but it was revived uh, and recreated through 3D printing and also the help of crowdsourcing. Vanderbilt University is doing 3D digital preservation of this text. I don't know what the 3D result looks like, but I think it's fascinating. Virginian Commonwealth University in their virtual curation laboratory does 3D versioning and printing of artif arch archeological artifacts. And here at that same university, Virginia Commonwealth University, we see a student cleaning up a 3D printed replica. So he's preparing this thing that we saw. Photo scanning, creating a 3D image, preparing that so that it can be modeled. 3D 360 video, here we see a student at the University of Virginia creating a 3D model of an ancient Greek vase. And DePaul University, we see the interest of the students, the fascination of the students. And here we see the use of 3D printing in primary school education, young students, eight or nine years old, and children building 3D designs and here, I love this photo. It is the total fascination of children seeing, watching the 3D printer. And this is my favorite. A tiny child who has been given this toy 3D printer, a toy so that she can print a new crown for herself. It's said that our children will learn less, but achieve more. And the question that I have for all of us is how will we contribute to the future? Thank you very much.